ESV Symposium. And this is our first ever. Uh, and uh, I'd just like to oh, yeah, thank my ESV and thank everyone for showing up today. Uh, we'll, I also want to point out that we have a few other events um, that will occur over the next couple of days. So later this evening, we'll have the local panel uh, with a couple of workshops following that, and that'll be at 6 p.m. And then uh, tomorrow we'll have a global panel with people uh, from all sorts of diverse backgrounds to discuss sustainability and climate and health. So uh, thank you again for joining and uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Francisco to introduce our keynote speaker. And Can you hear me? Yes. All yes, right, great. You. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll ask uh, everyone to please mute yourself uh, while uh, we have the speakers participating. I know it's tricky with Zoom, but we hopefully have this uh, under control. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone, for joining today um, um, for uh, this uh, unique uh, session uh, of our symposium. I think things uh, have uh, forced us to adapt, but here we are, and we're happy to have a uh, a great uh, a great event organized for everybody. Uh, very special uh, uh, thanks and warm welcome to Dr. Marcos Espinal, who I would like to introduce right now. Uh, Marcos Espinal is currently the director of the Department of Communicable Diseases and Environmental Determinants of Health at the Pan American Health Organization, uh, short for PAHO. Dr. Espinal is a national of the Dominican Republic. He holds a medical degree from the Universidad Autónoma de Santo Domingo, and he's a pediatrician with three years of residency at Robert Reed Children's Hospital of Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. Uh, Dr. Espinal's work experience includes positions in the Ministry of Health of the Dominican Republic and the National Center for Research on Maternal and Child Health, the New York City Public Health Department, and the World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva, where he worked for 13 years before joining PAHO in 2010 Dr. Espinel served as Executive Secretary of the WHO Stop TB Partnership, a global movement aiming at the elimination of TB as a public health problem. Dr. Espinel has published more than 100 peer-reviewed papers in the field of communicable diseases. He's a recipient of the Scientific Prize of the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, the Walter and Elise A. Haas International Award, by the University of California, Berkeley for a distinguished record of service in international health. The Princess Chichibu Memorial Tuberculosis Global Award by the Japan Anti-Tuberculosis Association and the American Chamber of Commerce of the Dominican Republic for his work and outstanding career in the field of research, public health and pediatrics. In 2018, Dr. Espinal was honored by the UC Berkeley School of Public oh. Health one of the 75 most influential public health alumni over the entire 75 years of history of the School of Public Health. He's also a member of the Forum of Microbial Threats of the United States National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine. Without further ado, thank you very much everyone and Marco, Dr. Marcos Espinal, please, welcome. Well, thank you, uh, Francisco, for that. Uh... You know, I, 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 I even didn't know that, the, well, I do know, but uh, all these accolades and things like that, uh, people uh, uh, usually uh, um, um, uh, don't try to, um, you're the first one, I think I read it completely, so. <laughs> uh, it, it, it looks like a little bit, uh, uh, maybe too much, maybe I need to, to look and, uh, and, and revise my, my bio again. <laughs> um, it is a pleasure. Thank you very much, uh, Francisco. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to represent uh, Dr. Etienne Carissa Etienne, Director of the Pan American Health Organization, um, and um, um, to speak to you today about One Health and some of the problems that 
we think we can address uh, uh, with uh, One Health. Um, uh, Dr. Etienne uh, sent her greetings and, and also apologies for she's not been able to speak today as, as, as she was also, <laughs> but, but certainly uh, she, she, uh, she wished you all well and she wished you all to complete your degrees and become great citizens and, and very successful in your careers soon. Um, um, I want to share with you some slides, but before I do, let me tell you a little bit what PAHO is. is. Uh, uh, PAHO is the Pan-American Health Organization, as Francisco was saying, is the oldest public health agency in the world. Um, it was founded in 1902 by the United States government and, and Cuba and other countries in Latin America to address the issue of yellow fever malaria and dengue in the, what is today, Cana Panama Canal, when the US was building the, can the Panama Canal. So uh, um, PAHO was founded in 1940s, the World Health Organization was founded. So, and it was proposed to the PAHO become um, uh, completely merged with WHO but the United States decided not. We wanted to keep PAHO as an independent agency. And, and, and the decision was that PAHO will serve, was going to serve as regional office for the Americas of the World Health Organization. So in other words, PAHO has two hats. PAHO is the regional office of the WHO, which headquarters are in Geneva. I was based there for 13 years, but also PAHO has its own independent constitution which allows PAHO to do agreements like the one we do with Purdue University. We have a memorandum of understanding, but also receive funding from donors independently of WHO. So that is why PAHO is a member of the inter-American system with the Organization of American States and the Inter-American Development Bank, all of them based in DC. So that's the Pan-American Health Organization. Our main clients are the countries of the Americas, 52 countries and territories. Uh, there are 35 of them member states, but we give the service to all others. Uh, uh, also to the territories of the UK, uh, territories in the Americas, of the Dutch territories and so on. Um, but we also deal uh, with WHO a lot and, and have extremely excellent relationship with the World Health Organization. So we wear both hats. Now, if you allow me going into uh, the task at hand today, it's, um, uh, let me share with you, uh, start the presentation. Um, okay, uh, Akash, you said you, you either can show it or I can share it. You, need, you have to give me the right or, or unless you, all right, I think I got it now, no? Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah, we can see it. Uh, let's see. Can you see it now completely or is that okay? Yeah, yeah, this is the full screen now. Okay, so, so, um, Kendry, remind me, how much time I have? Half an hour, 30 minutes, 45 minutes? I think 30 to 45 minutes. Is that right, Rebecca? Yes. All right. Try to do it less than that. So, so um, let me start by saying you probably have seen a lot in those days, the issue, you know, we are in the middle of a pandemic. And uh, you probably saw on Sunday CBS and Dateline, Fox News, you've been talking about the issue of the World Health Organization report on the visit to China and so on. And, and the issue if the, if the virus came from animals or leakage or things like that. So um, basically, you know, that's what One Health does, you know, 
uh, try to address health threats um, uh, within the human animal environment interface. And there are even talks now internationally of, of, of making One Health uh, the new the new treaty for you know addressing pandemics and sort of replacing or enhancing the international health regulations that probably some of you have heard about it. So let me give you a little bit of the background. Uh, what is the human, human, human animal environment interface? Well, if you see the, the graph, I think it's, it's very obvious that, uh, uh, you know, there is interaction between us, humans, animals, and the environment. Uh, if I give you an example, when a hurricane happens, you know, there is flood, there is destruction. So mosquitoes start breeding. So, and then we get to get uh, arboviral diseases like dengue, chikungunya, uh, Zika. You remember Zika in 2015? So this is, uh, these are sonotic diseases. And sonotic diseases, uh, a great percentage of them comes from the animal, um, from animals. So, and you're now hearing about COVID and, and, and if it really comes from bats and, and you know, SARS virus identifying bats. And there are some interesting um, hypotheses there. But if you, look at, if you look at this complex, complex because it's so crowded, you know, we have the environment, we have agriculture, we have uh, livestock, we have health services, we all, most of us have pets, you know, dogs, uh, you know, cats and so on. And we have to immunize them, the dogs, because, you know, dogs can transmit rabies, which is probably something you all have heard about it. And, and rabies is a somatic disease. So um, it's, an, it's a close interaction that requires that the participation of different sectors to be in order to address the problems. But it also requires that people forget a little bit about their own agendas and their own territories and see how can we find consensus and how can we work together to uh, address those problems. And, uh, and, and some of the problems that can benefit from One Health, it's as you are seeing there is sonotic diseases. Let's, let's elaborate a little bit more. On top of that, we have, you know, very important determinants that interact with us at daily basis. Let's talk a little bit about social determinants. Urbanization. If you think of Latin America, some of you may have visited some cities in Latin America, Lima, Rio, Sao Paulo, Bogota, Santo Domingo, all very crowded cities, all very poorly urbanized. I mean, uh, uh, Bogota is, 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 is making strides in, in, in better urbanization in some of these cities. And the favelas in Rio are getting better and better. But lack of planning in many of the cities in Latin America is responsible for the crowdedness, the, 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 the difficulties on, on, on moving and, and some people, and, and you find better environments in the, in the rural areas than in the urban areas. Uh, population growth, if you think of Asia, the main problem in Asia, it's population growth, hugely overpopulated cities. But think about Mexico City, for instance, <laughs> millions and millions and millions. So I don't need to tell you. Um, social exclusion. One thing you should know, WHO, the World Health Organization have six regional offices. The one for the Americas is PAHO, based in Washington, D.C. We have offices in every country of the America, basically mostly every country, not in all of them. But there are other five regional offices in, based in, out of Copenhagen in Europe for the European, uh, Cairo for the Eastern Mediterranean region, uh, New Delhi for Southeast Asia, Manila for the Western Pacific, and Congo Brazzaville in for Africa. The region 
with the highest rate of inequality and people living in situation of vulnerability is the Americas. And you will say, wait a second, why is that? Africa is the poorest one. Yes, that's the problem in Africa, is the poorest one. But in the Americas, economic is, countries are growing economically, but the wealth is not well distributed. A lot of rich people, but huge millions of number of people in poverty or in situations of vulnerability. Let me mention some. Um, Indigenous people, indigenous people in the Amazon, for instance, uh, people living in prisons, uh, Afro descendants, um, women, children, um, neglected people, uh, groups, population groups, very neglected. There are no benefit, not benefiting from the wealth that is uh, growing or happening in Latin America and the Caribbean. It's considered the highest, the rate of inequalities of the six WHO regions because Asia mostly population growth, Africa poverty. So it's, it's pretty much across the board, but it's a pity that countries are growing economically and in Latin America and the Caribbean, but many people are living in situation of vulnerability. And then the environmental determinants, which you know, climate change, you know, producing hurricanes and things like that, uh, emissions, you know, um, uh, I don't need to tell you, air pollution. These are determinants that influence our environment, influence our agricultural um, uh, and animals, influence animal health and, and human health. And, and, and certainly it's a complex issue. Let's talk a little bit about climate change and health. It has direct impacts. It impacts natural systems through natural system and it impacts through socioeconomic systems. And then you have a series of factors there, you know, like from extreme weather, so to air pollution, to uh, conflicts, you know, uh, forced displacement, like, you know, uh, crisis is political crisis, like the one in Syria, like the one in Venezuela, people migrating to other countries and suffering mental disorders. You know, COVID has been one of the most impacting in terms of mental health in, in not only in Latin America, but all over worldwide. So important that we take into account the, the complex conundrum of climate change and how climate change impact health system conditions and, and at the end, the health of the people. And, and there is no, uh, the, 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 it's clear that, that climate change, is, uh, no matter where you live, threatens your health. Um, and that is the reason PAHO has created a dedicated unit to ensure that addressing environmental determinants, health becomes factor into it. You probably have heard of the Green Climate Fund. The Green Climate Fund is a donor that funds climate change projects to countries and institutions and so on. Well, guess what? Most of the projects funded by the Green Climate Fund do not have a component on health. And this is why my good friend, Marcelo Cork, who is my unit chief, who is connected, head of the IMPAHO, the Environmental uh, determinants, uh, the unit that leads with environmental determinants of health. Um, it's working with the Green Climate Fund and with the countries of the Americas to make sure when they submit a proposal for the Green Climate Fund or for the European Union for funding, health is part of the proposal because we have a role to play. And, 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 and you know, uh, uh, here are some scary numbers between 2030 and 2050, climate change is expected to cause 250,000 additional deaths per year due to malaria, malnutrition, diarrhea, and other health issues. It's a major issue that we all have a role to play. And regarding to the Americas, you know, um, here are some of the hazards uh, related to climate change. 
waterborne diseases, which I mentioned, uh, uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, 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 I mentioned uh, vector-borne diseases like, like, like arboviral diseases, but waterborne diseases, cholera in Haiti. Don't forget cholera in Haiti, you know? Uh, in Peru, there were several outbreaks of cholera in the 19, in the 1990s, and, and you know, people forget about food safety. Peru started to control cholera after education on how to prepare ceviche that we all eat in great, in great Peruvian restaurant because it's one of the greatest uh, cuisines, cuisines in the world. You know, after Peru started to handle food safety with ceviches, cholera started to decrease in Peru. So important today, we're still, you know, uh, dealing with the, the cholera um, remnants in, in Haiti uh, uh, that happens several years ago. Um, sea level rise, air pollution, outbreak. I don't need to tell you about Zika. I was managing Zika in 2015 in the Americas. Um, drought, water, and food insecurity. One of the problems in Latin America, dear um, colleagues, is that when you look at the data regarding wash in Latin America, most of the countries have access to pipe water. Yes, they have access to pipe water, but the problem is the quality of that water. They don't have access to high quality water. And when you visit a country, you drink bottled water in many of these countries because you are afraid of getting a parasite or getting a disease and things. And this is something the unit of Marcelo is working with the countries to improve access to high quality water, not access to water, access to high quality water. What is the impact? So in 2017, Hurricane Maria caused 3,000 deaths in Dominica. 3,000 deaths, ladies and gentlemen, leaving $1.3 billion in damages. We're talking about no rich countries. We're talking about middle-income countries. In 2019, after five years of droughts, 1.4 million people were left in urgent need of food assistance in those countries you are seeing there. Even in the US, heat wave related events killed thousands of people. In Canada, and so on and so on. And we can continue talking about it. And the economic impacts related to climate change in the Caribbean. Over 200, more, more than a quarter of a million of people displaced um, remember the last uh, hurricane in the Bahamas? Everybody knew about that. That was a major issue, you know. Impact on the economy and tourism, impact on the energy, impact on transportation. So, and these are small islands in the Caribbean, very nice to visit and to spend a few days at the beach. But when you leave there, that's a problem. And this is a region that Pajo, has a lot of experience. Pajo has a health, the emergency department of Pajo deals not only with outbreaks, but also with natural disaster because the Caribbean is one of the, the regions most prone to natural disaster in the world. So, so um, there is impact everywhere. But let's talk a little bit now about human health outcomes. NTDs, or neglected zoonotic diseases. I mentioned some of them at the beginning. They are transmitted directly from an infected animal to a susceptible person or indirectly through the environment, vectors or animal. And I talk about dogs. Rabies in the Americas, almost eliminated. We have only, I, I don't think we have cases this year reported in last year. Um, um, and it is estimated that 60% of the four, more or less 400, uh, 1,400 infectious diseases affecting humans come are zoonosis from the interface human animal interface. So definitely we need to address the issue in close coordination with animal agriculture, with veterinary public health, 
not only thinking that human health is isolated. This is very important. And One Health is one initiative that could look into that. Look at all here, the overlapping of the neglected and vector-borne diseases in the Americas. I don't pretend you will understand all the, you, you will read the entire graph, but it's just to show in different colors, all these diseases, dengue, chikungunya, Zika, yellow fever, malaria, Chagas, how they overlap in our countries in the Americas region. And some of you, you know, will go to these countries to work as intern, as a spend time, a pasantia. It's great, you know. We have a center in Rio de Janeiro, it's called Pan American Center for the Elimination of Foot and Mouse Disease. It's looking after zoonotic diseases, it's looking after food safety, and it's looking after elimination of foot and mouse disease. It's the only center in the sixth region of WHO that is devoted to zoonotic diseases. It's a farm. So, so if any of you are interested as intern or some, uh, we also have partners. So, and, 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 and we are proud to say that every year we take interns in Washington and some of our countries and so on. We also work with partners like the Fio Cruz Foundation in, in Brazil, like the, the, the uh, several universities in Latin America and so on. Wildlife trade in Iquitos, Peru. Where is Iquitos? Some of you may know Iquitos. So it's in the Amazon uh, part of Peru. Uh, you know, the Amazon is not only in Brazil, it's Peru, it's Colombia, it's Ecuador, it's Brazil. And, and, and we're talking about today trade, wildlife trade and the Wuhan market, you know, regarding uh, COVID. But this is happening in Wikitos. I was there last year and I was offered uh, very exotic uh, meat there, you know, um, to eat. It's, 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 it's it's really a market. It's really a huge business uh, in the Amazon, and 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 and, and you can have all type of uh, offering in all these markets. Uh, from uh, Marcelo can tell you so, and 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 I saw it also. You know, uh, uh, alligators meat uh, and all type of, of things. That here it is: the seafood market selling live wildlife. This is the Wuhan market, the famous one that has been subject today of investigations and, um, and, and the visit of WHO. Um, but diseases are increasing in frequency. Here is a reminder, the Spanish flu in 1918, um, H3 and 2, H1 and 1, HIV was a sonotic disease at some point, but jumped completely to humans. Today, COVID, but we remember SARS, Ebola in West Africa a few years back. You know, definitely this is, and we were gonna have more. Don't think SARS, uh, COVID will be the last one. We are, you know, and, 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 and uh, certainly we are not yet there. This is why WHO is now revising or about to revise the international health regulation, which were revised in 2005 um, uh, last time, because certainly uh, COVID has shown that there are several challenges and the IHR needs to be revised. The international health regulation is a treaty every country of the world has signed that it's obliged to report any disease, any outbreak to WHO very related to the global health security agenda of the US that's probably some of you have heard. And these are the cycles, you know, sonotic pathogen, patho uh, sonotic diseases, emerging and re-emerging. I just mentioned SARS, uh, COVID and so on. And it, it is likely a jump from, it came from the animal, uh, uh, from bats, it is likely. So, so, um, um, and there's still several controversies around there. I hope I don't enter into those. <laughs> but my good friend, Peter Dashat, who was one of the members of the WHO visit, visit to Beijing, 
Uh, he works for the Global Alliance uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, in New York. Uh, um, uh, it's, 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 it's an alliance working for, for uh, uh, trying to, to, to contribute on the field of, of, of zoonotic diseases and in one health. Um, uh, they map uh, uh, hotspots for emerging diseases. And you see several hotspots here. Um, and they um, um, did a, a statistical analysis, putting some factors uh, into what are the contribution of these factors into, into making those uh, places in yellow as hotspots. And basically population, 28% uh, influence in, in increasing the risk of outbreaks and emerging zoonotic diseases, big cities. You know, we talk about Beijing, we talk about Mexico City, we talk about Bogota, Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, mammal diversity also, you know, like, and we have hotspots in the Americas. I can mention four besides the cities, the Amazon forest, La Mosquitia in Central America, um, and El Chaco in the border between Argentina, Paraguay. These are areas that um, are at risk and they could be also laboratories for pilot projects of One Health uh, activities on One Health initiative. And so, so uh, interesting, uh, and this was published in, in, in Nature Communication. So, so um, um, uh, Already, we know where the hotspots are. And what we need is to make sure governments and partners take action. Finally, what are the economic costs? Uh, look at this. We're talking about 50 billion H1 and 1 in 2009. We talk about, you know, 10 billion uh, food and mouth disease in. UK, Lyme disease in the US, you know, $200 million. Ebola in Africa, $10 billion. Zika, Latin America and the Caribbean, we experience that seven to 18 billion. And we have not yet accounted for the whole cause of COVID, but it's, it's going to be massive. Uh, let me check my time. Antimicrobial resistance is the other uh, topic that can benefit from One Health because there is resistant microorganisms in humans, animals, and in the environment. Um, and one of the conditions of One Health is to work multi-sectorial because it's intersectoral. You know, you need to bring together the environmental people with the agricultural people with, you know, um, the health people, but also other, 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 um, other, other, from other sectors, you know, we're talking about information technology, we're talking about digital health, we're talking about engineering, we're talking about, you know, um, uh, areas that, that can all contribute. Um, AMR impact on food production um, and, 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 and and you can see in the graph uh, to the left, you know, it can impact middle income, low income, high income um, uh, in terms of, of, of declining livestock production due to poor animal health and export restrictions. You know, there are several antibiotics that are used in animal health and we need to promote that this needs to be controlled and stop it. Cholestine is one of them. We have four countries in the Americas that has banned the use of cholestine in animals. Foodborne diseases, you know, I don't need to mention cruises, outbreaks of foodborne diseases and so on. Responsible diarrhea, diarrheal diseases, responsible for 95% of foodborne illnesses, uh, impact the tourism industry. Uh, uh, it's just a complex issue, but it can benefit if we apply the One Health approach. And here is the circle in red, going back to my uh, slide, the earlier slide, if we can apply some of, some of um, uh, preventive actions, uh, uh, 
there, then we can maybe protect people from getting, it's complex, but we all have to work together and all these sectors have to work together to ensure that humans are protected, but also animals to be protected and, and, and our environment to be protected. So the last part is what is the One Health? You know, it requires intersectoral, interprogrammatic and interdisciplinary policy and government mechanism for promoting and protecting simultaneously the health of people, animals and the environment in an integrated manner. And as CDC has created an office, the office, the One Health office, and, and it's becoming the topic and, and several heads of state yesterday published from Europe and other countries published uh, an opiate in several news, uh, newspapers uh, uh, like El País in Spain, Le Monde in France, uh, calling for One Health approaches to, to, to prevent zoonotic uh, pandemics and so on. But it can also help in food safety. It can also help in AMR and so on. The challenge is that One Health phase is inadequate government mechanism because people tend to think in their own territories and not to think on how to address together the human animal environment interface. interface. Cultural limitation to intersectoral work. Well, my territory is the parent, the most important one, so I need to make sure. Um, uh, lack of leadership, accent of country policies, and priority shift. Remember, head of states sometimes in in resource in low income countries and, and middle income countries um, change. They change also in industrialized country, but policies are more respected. Not always, but more. But, um, but in, in, in low income and middle income countries, policies change because of the new head of states or the new minister of environment, the new minister of health. Oh no, my priority is this and that and so on. So that's the situation, continuity. How to operationalize One Health? Well, we are now working in a policy that our countries hope, we hoped our countries and members endorse in September in our board, the Board of PAHO, which is made of all the countries of the Americas, the ministers of health, that adopt some strategic actions in that policy that they recognize or map the national context within the human animal environment interface, the main actors. Which are the actors? Not only governmental, NGOs, civil society and others. We are recommending the need to establish mechanisms for governance, stewardship and finance one health. So they all sit around the table. We are going to promote the fostering of intersectoral and multi-sectoral technical activities. For instance, integrated surveillance that could look into animal or in humans also, diseases and so on, working together. Um, research, uh, the need for research agendas that could be implemented in pilot areas that are hotpot diseases, uh, hotpot for diseases. The need to incorporate risk analysis approaches, the embracing of digital health solutions and the promotion of a research agenda. So, um, 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 PAHO for many years has been leading or convening a meeting of ministers of health and ministers of environment. Uh, it's called the RINSA. The RINSA is a ministerial meeting that we convene every three to four years, last one in Paraguay in 2016, where ministers of health and ministers of agriculture convene to talk and we, they talk about One Health in Paraguay. One of the problems that is always the operationalization. It's a major challenge. And in Paraguay, we brought also ministers of environment. Um, so this policy hopefully is made um, part of our, uh, approved by our governing bodies. If our board approve it, then the countries of the Americas are bound to implement those because they are the board members, the ministers of health. But we know it's important also to bring other agencies like the United Nations Environmental Program, like, uh, you know, uh, the World Meteorological Agency or something like that. So definitely One Health fits into the framework of a global framework because the sustainable development agenda or the sustainable development goals 
are in a sense a one health approach. They have goals for animal health, for agricultural health, environment, and so on. So one health fits within the sustainable development goals. Um, and certainly um, uh, we're working with WHO, it's moving. Sometimes slow, but it's moving. So, so these are some of the principles, you know, are going to be promoted. And hopefully, you know, within 2021 and 2030, you know, the countries of the Americas move forward in implementing one health projects for AMR, for food safety, for zoonotic diseases and outbreaks and pandemic, but also for any other, any other health issue that may apply, not necessarily, because we don't see one health as one side fitting all. So, you know, um, it has to deal with, you know, environment, it has to deal with animal, it has to deal with human. And, and, and this is part also of the global, the strategy that Marcelo is putting together for the region of the Americas in terms of, you know, um, 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 addressing the environmental determinants of health and addressing, making sure health is part of any strategy a country put together to deal with, uh, you know, um, environment issues like, you know, health, uh, like air pollution, like um, uh, environmental epidemiology and so on. I think that's it, you know. Uh, this is my last slide, I think. Uh, we uh, hope to have this policy approved. And uh, I thank you for your time. If I took a little bit more time, I apologize, but I have time. So I'm happy to answer questions and, and comments from you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Espinel. Uh, yeah, if you all have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and uh, we'll have a Q&A session here. I want to maybe start off with a question of my own as maybe other questions filter in, but it, I noticed that a lot of the hotspots were, and as you mentioned, highly populated areas, but then also in your next steps, you mentioned uh, resilience and sustainable cities. So I'm curious if you have specific ideas or examples of certain cities that you think are uh, considering One Health principles within their design or, or things that they're doing to address these things? Yeah, you know, uh, that, that's an interesting question. Bogota it has done a lot in urbanization and, and transportation, uh, addressing some of the social determinants and environmental determinants. So it's very difficult for a city to become just the one health issue. I think it's important that identify the problem and try to address it. So um, I just came across actually um, of, of a very nice uh, One Health project in, in Foz de Iguazu in Brazil, addressing, uh, adopting the One Health concept to, to prevent and to address vector-borne diseases. And, and they have seen, and it's been published in PLOS actually, they have seen a major reduction and by bringing together the community, because community is important to engage when applying some of these uh, uh, um, One Health approaches. So uh, there are some examples. India also did a lot of, uh, uh, for some uh, in Kerala, for some uh, approaches on One Health to, to implement. Yeah, you know, the key issue, uh, Kendrick, is um, it's basically the political will. The political will is important and the will of the people to address this issue. And when you empower the community, the community demand from the leaders to, to, and the governments to, to take care of this problem. So we, we hopefully with this new policy in PAO, we hope that countries become more engaged and, and, and adopt the One Health approaches for which we will offer our technical cooperation not only for, with my staff and the staff of Marcelo, but also with partners like Purdue and others, because we, we in Pajo don't know everything. We don't have all the capacity. That is the reason we have agreements with academia. We have also collaborating centers with major institutions on environmental issues, uh, and NIH or National Institute of Health or so on. But you know we have several collaborating centers because if we don't have the staff 
we do have a partner to offer to a country to provide that. I see a question also uh, from Chelsea, I think that I did not mention the distrust in government during health crisis. Yes, she's completely right. Uh, that's a good point. Um, and it's part in the outbreaks and pandemics. Yeah, the distrust, distrust is, is a huge problem as, as it is also fake news, you know? The fake news issue that we see every day and COVID has been one of the most uh, uh, impressive in terms of promoting fake news because we have seen a lot uh, of those. And our advice to government is look at look at after the webs look at the websites of reputable institutions, reputable academic institutions, you know agencies that has a, a record. Don't because we all have a friend, we all have a colleague, we all have a relative who tells, oh look at this. Can you tell me? And if we are in the business of health, they always ask, us, is this true? Is this not true? Uh, always ask, double check, uh, distrust is a problem. And you know why there is distrust? Because a lot of corruption in many of our countries also, you know, and governments that are corrupted and, and things that are happening, you know, it, you saw how, what happened also in this country with COVID with, you know, uh, 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 the contradictions between uh, governments and some academic institutions and some other institutions in Brazil is happening also. So um, it, it's a very difficult issue because sometimes it's political. I also had a question sent to me privately. Uh, if we think back to your comments about the adoption of safe food practices in Peru with regards to ceviche, how were you able to change attitudes and behaviors around food safety and wash practices in this country or region? This is often hard to do no matter the country. And can you repeat that again, please? The last part. Yes. How were you able to change attitudes and behaviors around food safety and wash practices in this country or region? This is often hard no matter the country. It is very hard. Um, education should be a continuing. One of the th when we talk about risk communication, also we need, we tell governments in our region, you need to constantly bombard the population with good education. Risk communication is important. What is good, what is not good. Say it when you don't have information. When you don't know, say it. It's better to say, I don't know, but we will update as soon as we can when we get the information. You know, someone asked me yesterday, actually a person, a, 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 a professional person, she, she asked me, I have the AstraZeneca vaccine and they are offering me now Pfizer. Can I use it? I said, no, because we don't know yet if we can combine those. There is a clinical trial in the UK running now about combining different vaccines because these two vaccines are different methods. You don't know how your immune system is going to react. So there's nothing wrong by saying, I don't know. But the key issue is education. If we don't educate countries, then the world will be continuing, not only in fake news, but also in food safety. You know, food safety is really critical and there are five or six steps, very simple, that we need to continue making sure people know how to handle food, not only in the kitchen, in the table. That is why the principle there was there from farm to the table, because there, there are different, I mean, yes, it's very tough, but the solution is continue educating people. And I know it's very true. Changing behavior is one of the most difficult things, you know, very difficult, but you can, you can do it. Some people change, some others don't. <laughs> That's the reason we need to continue working and educating people. How do you think common people can become engaged considering how divided people are nowadays? Yeah, that's, um, that's an issue um, in, 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 in some countries more than others. Um, um, uh, but I think 
if we are honest, if we are, uh, you know, um, allow difference of opinions, if we, there's nothing wrong by disagreeing or agreeing to disagree, then we can try to find consensus. I was for seven years, for seven years, head of the Stop TB Partnership, a global movement based in Geneva. And there were more than 1000 partners and I was the executive director. So when the board used to meet every six months, 32 board members, very few times we voted because we always find, found consensus. And when we couldn't find consensus, we said, we decided, we, we, we took the decision, let's pause, let's sleep on it and come back tomorrow, the second day of the board. And we, we always find consensus. Sometimes you don't, but if, you know, as long as you respect the, respect the opinion of others, as long as you think it's, 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 it's difference of opinion and you're honest and, and transparent, then I think we can become more engaged and more engaged, and, you know, and it's a tough one. Uh, and, 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 you know, look at the vaccine hesitancy with, with COVID and, and what is happening that some people don't trust and they, and what we need to show is the benefits of the vaccine you know, basically, because it's beneficial for me and, and, and for my agency, it's highly beneficial. So that's it. Are there any circumstances where these advisory bodies made a mistake and accidentally delivering correct information? and had to rebuild, to rebuild trust after that. Mm. Well, I, I, I don't think uh, humans are not perfect. We are all imperfect. And the reasons we get together is to try to find consensus and the best decisions. But I, 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 wouldn't, I, I don't rule out that board made mistakes because they do sometimes. But the important thing is to be humble and admit that there was a mistake. And I made a mistake or we made a mistake and we are, you know, a few days ago, there was news in the New York Times about AstraZeneca vaccine, 79% efficacy. And then there was questioning by NIH and several committees saying, no, they, they are not using the most recent data. And AstraZeneca immediately rectified and it reduced the, the efficacy rate. So, uh, yeah, it's more difficult rebuilding trust after you made a mistake, but if it's a mistake that is not intentional, that if we are honest and transparent and we correct it, I, I think there's, for me, for me, there's space for everything, for everyone. You know, there's space for disagreements, there's space for agreements, and there's space for, you know, um, let, let me say something because I saw another comment, very interesting point regarding agreement versus voting. I was not saying, I was, I was not putting into question agreement versus voting, not against each other. When you have to vote, you vote because we vote in elections also. So I said, if you find consensus, it's much better before you go into vote, but sometimes you have to vote. And then if the voting decide that's the way to go, that's the way to go. Although you know, you know what happened here with with uh, you know <laughs> with election recently, so um, things happened. So, all right, good. Uh, yeah, we had a question. What are some of the ways to stay ahead of emerging zoonotic diseases in the future? That is, like, how do we detect them earlier? What are activities that we should maybe avoid? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, actually the World Health Organization has decided after that the international health regulations are going to be revised. And certainly because there are challenges there and deficiencies. And this process is now ongoing. And the process uh, follows is that experts from different countries are invited from the US, from Canada, US, from Brazil, from many countries are invited. And even sometimes countries are asked, you wanted to put experts on board there um, because the World Health Organization is about 192 countries that are members. 
and everyone has the right to suggest names. So, um, so and the US is very active in WHO. I mean, uh, there are plenty of staff in, in Geneva from the US and several, they participate in several committees. Uh, Dr. Fauci actually is the head of the US delegation to WHO in Geneva. Um, um, and, and that process is takes some time. It goes in preparation of documents, revisions of the core capacities of the IHR. The International Health Regulation IHR has some capacities, between 13 and 15 capacities. I don't remember the exact number now. These capacities are the way to stay ahead. One of them is surveillance of diseases. The other one is response to diseases, like have, you know, prepare ICUs, intern intensive care units, uh, personal protective equipment, like, you know, N95s, like, you know, um, 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 uh, clothing and so on. So uh, there are 14, 15 capacities, ports of entry, which are very important, airports, ports, and so on. So uh, these capacities tell countries what they need to do. However, the revision will go further now and probably other capacities will be incorporated. And some of them, some of the experts are now uh, promoting, it's gotta be based on one health, bringing together animal, agriculture, human, environment, uh, stakeholders around the table to make sure um, we stay ahead. But, uh, you know, um, availability of commodities, availability of vaccines, of drugs, of, of of, of, of diagnostics. This, this are, this, and this is why research and development is important. This is why academia has a critical role. Uh, this is why National Institutes of Health has critical role in funding academia to make sure new tools are incorporated. Digital health, the new tools of, you know, information technology and things like that. We need real life data real-time data, you know, immediately. In many countries, we don't have real-time data. That's uh, how the way to stay ahead is to boost research and development, is to boost our treaties that govern the preparedness and response to pandemic and to update them because we need to apply the lessons learned in this pandemic to prevent the future pandemic because there will be others. Eh? I have uh, a quick question, kind of relating it back to climate change. I think you've got a pretty unique position where your your work, your I mean, your training is in medicine and and health, but then you're also in public health, medicine and public health. And and so yeah, I, I'm curious. It seems like in my experience, a lot of people that talk about climate change or engage with climate change studied some sort of an environment uh, before they got really engaged with it. So. Oh, maybe what what got you engaged with considering the connection between climate change and health? And was there a certain moment, or or maybe what do you recommend people do to to bring other people into that conversation? Well, I think I think um, you know um, Marcelo Marcelo is a doctor and engineer also, so he can he can say a word here. So and and I'll invite him to say a word. But I think for me actually it's the experience in the field, what I saw in, what I have seen in the field. I have the luxury or the, uh, you know, the opportunity to visit in my work more than 115 countries from Siberia to um, China seven or eight times. Um, and I have seen so much poverty. I have seen so much neglect. I have seen you know, so much damage from natural disaster, hurricanes, and, and outbreaks of viral, arboviral diseases. And it's very obvious when you see the impact of climate change on people. Well, you, you saw probably the photos of the Bahamas crisis. Uh, uh, how holds, houses without house, basically. Families without houses. It happens here also in the States with the tornadoes and things like that. In Midwest, I think, no, you know, when they, they take all the houses and things like that. So I think the connection is pretty, for me, it was to see how you see outbreak of diseases immediately following a natural disaster or 
a, a climate change disaster. This is, this is, this is pretty, pretty connected. Uh, and, and for me, it was the experience in dealing with all these diseases, you know, uh, globally. And, 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 and I don't know if you remember the, the earthquake in Haiti. Uh, I think in 2010, you know, um, it was it was it was devastating to see you know people dead on the streets and and outbreaks and so on. Well, cholera came after that, so that's the connection and the experience you accumulate. Marcelo, you want to say something? Uh, thank you, Marcos. Uh, coming from a little different perspective, since I'm really coming from the engineering world and not from the medicine world, but I also think it has been together to with what you just mentioned, is to learn to see issues with different lenses and to understand that our, one lens is not the only lens. Uh, the fact that we can see a problem like such as climate change or any public health issue uh, does not mean that I'm right. It just means that I know how to see it from my specific lens. And if we are open to start to see the issues from the different lenses and reaches us to get uh, the type of integrated approaches and solutions, such as the one that you presented today with One Health. It's not really only about having the infectious health connected with the animal health, how's connected with the environment, how's connected with the social uh, determinants, and that conversation and make them all valid is what makes the issue potent and finding those long-lasting solutions. Thank you, Marcos. But the other issue is when you look at the use of satellites and, and, and uh, that's also related to the question of, of how we stay ahead. When you use the satellites and you see all what is happening through satellite, uh, what is happening in the Amazon forest, the destruction and the and the things that also destroy the fauna and the and the fauna and the, the forest and and the animals and, and the things that live there in that the habitat. And you know, it comes the it has to deal with also the emissions and and uh, you know uh, the Amazon is the greatest, you know, probably thing in that the world is keeping this climate alive, this world alive and things like that, for breathing good air and things like that. So we need to make sure we don't destroy the Amazon and the thing. So I see a question from Rebecca. Is there any effort being made since COVID to look at the health inequities among the countries in the Americas to try and make the access to healthcare more equitable? Well, yes, PAHO has um, a, a cross-cutting unit, not under my leading. It's, it's a cross-cutting unit that looks in, look into gender, into human rights, and into uh, gender, human rights, and um, and, um, and what is the other one, uh, uh, Marcelo? Well, it, it look into this is gender, human rights, and so on. Uh, and they are having working with the governments and the countries, making sure that, for instance, data are not only reported as only data, but they are disaggregated by, you know, gender by. Uh, 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 um, uh, nationality uh, or ethnic group and so on, but uh, also by groups of people living in situation of vulnerability. The analysis we are doing in our departments of evidence and intelligence is now looking at different, you know, at the poor always, the most affected, and 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 so um, and 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 and. and Something that has happened in the last several years in, the, in Latin America is the social impact programs that has been put in place in Brazil by President Lula, by former President Lula, uh, but in other countries in, in the Americas, like providing social and finance help to those uh, poor groups or group living in situation of vulnerability. Uh, uh, that's uh, it's called social, you know, responsibility and financing. Uh, um, uh, trying to subvencionar uh, a las familias. Um, family, uh, the term in English doesn't come to mind now. I'm probably tired, but um, 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 certainly there are several programs to help 
uh, groups living in situation of vulnerability and also the poor in Latin America uh, to finance. And now with COVID, they are all being more strengthened actually in, in many of those countries. Uh, which previous countries, history of colonization has any responsibility for the success of these countries? I should not comment on issues related to member states, but personally, I do think they have a responsibility, yes. <laughs> that was the last question, I think, in the chat. Yeah, there are other questions. Yes. So it means I didn't disappoint you. There was a lot of questions. <laughs> I know this has been very informative and uh, I just want to give another moment in case anyone has a question come to mind. But uh, while, while I'm doing that, I just want to remind those that are still on the call that you can vote for our, our art exhibition. Uh, if you go to our website, you can submit a vote for uh, awards to the popular award, uh, submit a vote for the popular awards. And, um, and then we do have the two other events in, once this evening and once tomorrow evening. Um, yeah. Looks like we just had another question. What are some key innovations that might help with the One Health efforts? Well, I think something I, I just mentioned, uh, it's going to help is the digital health. It's the use of satellite, the geo and all these new tools are every day on a daily basis. The, the IT people are, are getting, giving strong uh, contributions. So um, um, virtual tools, we, we, we are learning more and more and more now how to use virtual tools, you know, with this pandemic. So I think that will be massive in One Health, uh, I, I also think the issue of surveillance is key. If animal agricultural people can join forces with human health people uh, to do integrated surveillance, uh, and there are some good examples out there, you know, that could benefit. Uh, I mean, um, that could be also uh, um, uh, a good uh, uh, thing to use. Uh, the issue of real real time data is vital, uh, and, and we're we're still not yet there. So to innovate and to make it easy for poor countries to adopt it, because you know what function in the U.S. or England sometimes doesn't function in Haiti or in in uh, in Ecuador. Uh, it's important that. And this is why it's important because we live in a globalized world. It is important that if we innovate, that innovation is also available to everyone. Look at the example of the vaccine. 90% 90 of the people vaccinated so far, it's in the industrialized world, not in Africa or in the South. We need to make sure. That is what I call that is what I call a human disgrace, that the vaccines are not yet fully available to everyone. They should be. They should be. I can understand that governments want to vaccinate their own people, but there should be a mechanism that we say, this is a global public good. It should be everywhere. So this is what I call good innovation, public health innovation. One of the great public health innovation, vaccines. When we are kids, we are vaccinated. They have, we eliminated polio. We eliminated, uh, well, polio is almost one or two more countries, but smallpox, you know, was eliminated. Oral rehydration, cheap, very cheap. One of the greatest inventions in the world for cholera, diarrheal diseases. So, I think that's why academia needs to keep going and going. And you guys need to keep going because you are the brilliant minds of tomorrow. Awesome. Yeah, I, I haven't seen any new questions appear in the chat. I also want to make a plug that Marcelo is on our global panel tomorrow. So I'd love to hear a little bit more from him. Uh, 
Um, but yeah, if there are no other questions, I'll give I'll give another moment or two. Uh, but this has been a pleasure, Dr. Espinel. Thank you, my pleasure. Yeah, happy to uh, contribute. Oh, we just got another question. Uh, what changes should be made to the vaccine industry? As a private sector, companies are intensely competitive and protective over intellectual property. Is this contributing to inequality of distribution? It's a tough one. On one side, the issue of intellectual property is important because you want to stimulate research and development. And you need to find a way to protect also because if everyone is copying everything, then that's not good also. On the other side, in, when we talk about a pandemic, we need to find consensus or, or solutions that we can make available uh, this global public good to everyone one way or another. And, and when you look at, you know, many of these companies that are producing the vaccine now for COVID were subsidized by the government of the US and the UK. So it doesn't fully apply the issue. There is issues there about the patent issue. I'm not an expert, I'm not a law person, uh, and these always have to do with the World Trade Organization and, and things like that. Uh, but you know, I tell you something WHO did. WHO created a, an initiative so where private sector and companies can share their innovations and to potentially for transferring of technology after COVID. No one has put anything on that. No one industry or pharma or nothing. It's, it's a very difficult issue because uh, it's very competitive. The private sector needs to be for profit and needs to make money also. I can understand that. And people live out of the private sector. They have a role also. The private sector has an important role. Don't get me wrong. And, and I don't have a solution, unfortunately, but we, we need to be able to find a solution for those. This is a, a sobering lesson learned, the COVID one. People are dying, you know, and, and, and still, you know, just countries are short of the vaccine. The estimates are some of countries in the world are going to receive vaccines in 2022, not this year. Sobering. But good question. I, I, good question. You know, you, you're tough. You guys are good. You know, good question. I like those. So, good questions. And, 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 you know, the US, UK, China, Russia, they all are in this organ, the World Trade Organization, and they all deal with this. And it's a tough one. It's a tough one. You know, um, back in the 80s, 90s, Brazil broke a patent for one of the antiretrovirals in Thailand. And that created a huge crisis. And, but they did break it. And they started to, to, to manufacture antiretrovirals for his own people. But now, if country breaks a patent, it's subject to huge fines and 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 all sorts of problems, so. Yeah. Hopefully someone come with a bright solution after this pandemic on this issue, because, you know, if you look into the website, if you go into the website of WHO, you will find the initiative for research and development of the, top, the 10 most uh, deadly outbreaks that we are expecting. Uh, and there is one called the, I think it's the X disease that we don't know what it is, X. And the others are Nipah, um, anthrax, that is, they become very pandemic. Forget about the movies you all saw before, Outbreak and Dustin Hoffman and all these type of things and things like that. And, Ebola, Ebola happening in restaurant here in Washington DC, you know, monkeys at some point. 
Anyhow, we're going to have more epidemics. There's no way we're going to, they're going to stop. I think Francisco might have a question. Uh, we can't hear you, Francisco. Yeah, we cannot hear Francisco. <laughs> Maybe he can type it into the chat for us. Yeah. Um, and and Dr. Espinal, is there a certain like um, is there a way that people could become more involved or uh, stay up to date with PAHO or um, if, if like there were partnerships between Purdue and PAHO? Um, do you so the key your, the key to that question is Marcelo Cor. You you have you in tomorrow him and so yeah he he has a unit. Plenty of good stuff there in climate change, on air pollution, on environmental epidemiology, on wash, water and sanitation. So Marcelo is your guy. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you, Kendrick. And thank you, Dr. Espinal. Um, so yeah, I was, I was going to um, you know, do, make that final pitch to precisely that question. Uh, we do have um, a handful of initiatives going on with PAHO, uh, it's been about uh, a couple years of work now uh, with a little bit of a, of a hiccup because of the pandemic, obviously. Yeah. PAHO was uh, busy otherwise, very understandably. But luckily we've been able to uh, have a couple of projects going on with them, actually one on COVID and, um, and wastewater surveillance. And um, as, as Dr. Espinel mentioned in the beginning, we have, we have two um, framework agreements with um, PAHO. One is to give Purdue students the opportunity to intern there um, at their DC headquarters or one of their field countries in the Americas. The internship opportunity is actually quite interesting right now because of COVID, um, it could be um, remote. And yeah. you could continue working on your studies and your research. So actually it's more worked out for grad students. Um, and the other possibility is actually to get engaged with uh, faculty that are working on, on these subjects and who are uh, jointly working or would like to work jointly with uh, PAHO experts. And we have a couple of those going on as well. And uh, yeah, I would say the, the first, uh, First point of contact would be uh, through ESE and, and us, the Office of Professional Practice, who has been facilitating the internships. But um, the um, would be happy to to help. I think it's been a, a successful first couple of years for the relationship between Paho and and Purdue. And um, yeah, there's a lot of promising uh, projects. So I think this will be this will be growing in the next years. That's great. And, and the other thing I was going to say is that in, in Spanish, there's a saying that if you say goodbye too much, you really don't want to go. So we, we keep saying well, there are no more questions, but some questions pop up. So it is, it is a good sign, and, and I'm glad things uh, have worked out. Uh, apologies for that uh, you know, little inconvenience with the un unmuted mics at the beginning, but I think that happens on every Zoom meeting. So I've seen that happening on uh, uh, European Parliament meetings as well. So, you know. We just feel that special, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Huh? It's been great. All right. Well, if there are no more questions, then uh, yes. H Kendrick said we still have a couple more events. Um, one tonight with a local panel and a global panel going on uh, tomorrow. Uh, where Dr. Marcelo Cork will be joining and uh, um, along other experts will be talking about this, this uh, very issues. So thank you everyone for joining. And once again, thank you very much, Dr. Espinal. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, it was an honor.